I think my Ferrari 296 GTS is winning some kind of strange competition amongst the Schmiemobiles to be the car that I've driven the least in the amount of time I've owned it. Hi guys, I'm Schmie, hello, and welcome back to the channel where today we are taking the Rosso Dino Ferrari out for a drive for a few things. Number one, to explain why I've basically abandoned it. Number two, to discuss owning three different Ferraris and what the story with each of them is. Number three, to talk about the Ferrari game. I'm sure you know what I mean. And number four, how the 296 and the SF90 actually stack up against one another. Collection day of this car was about three months ago at HRO and Ferrari in Hatfield. Now my dealer is Mayfair, but Hatfield is a sister showroom. It's a very convenient place to head. So I picked up the GTS, which is obviously the spider version of the 296 GTB. Now this is the, I wanna say entry Ferrari supercar. It's no entry car, it's 830 horsepower, but because it links to the original Dino, that's why I spec'd it in Rosso Dino. And I absolutely love the spec of this. Normally I have a thing for blue Ferraris, hence blue Le Mans on the Pura Sangue, and we've got blue Electrico over on the SF90. But this, I felt was different in its character. Went for it, but the strange thing is, since then, I've only driven it about 300 miles. I can already hear the screams. Why buy a brand new Ferrari if I'm only going to drive 300 miles in three months? And there are kind of three reasons for that. The first is that this 296 actually arrived about six months before I expected it to arrive. From when I locked in the specification, I was thinking it would come early next year, that it would be ready in time for spring with the roof down. Number two, is that that also arrived. And with it being winter time, winter weather, it was far more suitable to pop some winter tires on the four wheel drive practical car for the recent tours around. Number three is because I've basically been away nonstop since this landed. It arrived, we got it PPF'd. I then went to America for two months, came back, picked up the Pura Sangue, took that away. So up to this point, other than a few journeys home and back, I've not really driven this thing much. You're probably also thinking, isn't this, the SF90, now a bit redundant, given there's a 296 GTS, and I'm also lucky, as you know now, to have an SF90 XX coming in the future. Arguably, yes, but I want to talk a little bit more later on about how these two actually compare, because what is bizarre to me is that they're both mid-engined hybrid Ferrari supercars, but my goodness, are they different driving experiences? I have done a few back-to-backs and I cannot get my head around how far apart these two cars are. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that when we're out on the road later. First topic of discussion I want to talk about, why buy so many cars? I'm lucky to own the three Ferraris here. And in addition to those, also have a Roma Spider coming, have the SF90 XX coming and I think I've been pretty clear there are gonna be more things beyond that. We will get to them as and when down the line and it makes no sense, but collecting anything I think makes no sense. Whether it's Lego cars, whether it's the maxi swatches, whether it's the heritage gas pumps, whether it's sneakers, watches, whatever it might be that people collect, my obsession is cars. And this will lead us on later on to talking about brands like Ferrari, Porsche, McLaren, Mercedes, all of the companies that you know and you know a bit about how they work. Whether it's cars, whether it's watches, whether it's handbags, jewelry, whatever it might be, premium brands, they have their systems, we could say. But with cars, I spend my life driving, I love doing road trips, I love the experiences, and being fortunate enough to do so, and not only to experience these kind of cars myself and do as many things as I do, but also to create these videos and share those experiences and let you know a little bit more about what it's like and what you actually go through and experience yourself as a customer of something like this. It was the dream for me 10, 15 years ago, and now it's still unbelievable that I get to live it and to create this content around it. So why buy them all? It's man logic, there's no real reason. It doesn't make any sense other than it's fun. I'm very lucky to be able to do so. And between these cars, what I find very interesting even looking at the three Ferraris here, right? We've got a V8, a V6, and a V12. We've got a four-wheel drive hybrid with three electric motors. We've got a rear-wheel drive hybrid, one electric motor. We've got a naturally aspirated engine. We've got the four-seater, four-door practical car. We've got the two-seater Spider, and we've got the two-seater Coupe. Three very different Ferraris. When you throw in the Roma Spider to that mix, we then have a car that is a front-engine or mid-front-engine convertible. So again, a different experience to any of these. When the XX adds to the collection, it's the most extreme track focused version of the cars. I can see a few other 
different types of experiences that will be on offer. And then, of course, you get different generations of cars. You know, if we come over here with the SLS and the GT Black Series, you could argue that these are in many ways the same thing. But I can promise you, in terms of driving experiences, they are so different. You've got the brutish 6.2 litre NA V8 in the SLS with the gullwing doors. You've got the immense performance of the 4 litre bi-turbo V8 in the GT Black Series, which was, of course, a Nürburgring record holder at the time. So it's very hard to come up with any actual logic, but I think we all, as human beings, love something, love collecting something. I admit fully that I'm a hoarder. I've always been a person who keeps everything, whether it's lanyards for events, whether it's my old number plates, whether it's the different things I collect. And my latest obsession, well, over the last 10 years has been cars. And at the moment, what Ferrari are doing, I'm absolutely blown away by. The cars they make are amazing, and the lineup is very exciting. By way of an update with the Pura Sangue, you've seen a lot of it recently. And the funny thing is that this car actually already has 10 times the mileage of this one. That will change in future. I just took it straight away from collecting it all the way through Germany, driving down the Autobahn, through the mountains, onwards to Italy, across to Monte Carlo, and then diverted back home when we had this very haphazard tour that all was a little bit chaotic. But after doing big tours in a car, something I personally quite like to do is almost pop it into hibernation for a bit. Don't drive it for a little bit. Kind of let myself forget what that experience is like, because then when you get back into it, it feels even more special again. This is potentially a placebo effect purely in my own mind, but I find that when I haven't driven a car for a bit and I get back into it, I get to truly appreciate what that car actually offers, what the experience of it is like. Now, I don't see it as my daily. This is not a car that I'm going to literally daily drive because it's a bit too big and more than I need. You know, I love driving around countryside lanes, something small, something nimble, something that's just fun to drive, which is why often, and you don't normally see it, the Amira is my go-to. This is the car that I take the most frequently for my short drives. I don't video every one of them. I don't video everything. This has done three or 4,000 miles now. Sometimes the 1M, sometimes the Clio V6, those kinds of cars. Yes, they're not going on the big tours. We will hopefully get some of them over to the Nürburgring at some point, but the Amira is the go-to. Wireless Android Auto, very small, very easy, more than enough space for me. If I'm on my own, for example, the passenger seat is plenty for my luggage and there's a bit behind as well. So I don't need something as big as this, but when it comes to a longer journey, a longer outing, an outing where you have more people, more stuff with you. My goodness, this is incredible for that purpose. The problem is that it's a bit big for parking spaces and that does change what you can do with a car. And in fact, it points us in that direction because the 296 is almost the ultimate of what the Amira is. So by way of an update of this, we'll leave it I'll take it out, of course. I need to actually remove the Austrian vignette sticker from the windscreen. I'm not just gonna leave it and never drive it again. It will just sit for the next month or two before we start getting it out in action again. Keep it looking tidy and pretty for a short time as it was absolutely filthy after that tour. This is one of those UK days where it is dreary and miserable which is not suited to an 800 plus horsepower Ferrari. However, the lanes open up and what I do in here all the time so far is rear window down, into manual, into performance, into race. And we'll talk about how many different settings and things that is in a second. Drop it down some gears and get ready to do a bit of this. Although being not fully run in, I can't completely give it the beans, but I tell you what, for these kinds of roads, you know, English countryside lanes, whether it's wet and miserable or whether it's dry, beautifully sunny and lovely, this car is so perfectly dialed in. There are some significant differences between it and the SF90, as I mentioned, and we'll touch more on that a little bit later. But down here, the sounds, and by having the rear window down, even if you have the roof up, yes, we could put it down, and Brits love roofs down on winter days with the heat blasting and I've got the heated seat on as well. It just sounds mega. I didn't really appreciate before how good the Piccolo V12, the little V12, the V6, that's what Ferrari nickname it, could actually sound. It's not as quick responding as the SF90, but when you start to go down the gears, it's just got that wonderful sonorous tone to it. And my first 
car really that I showed on the channel was my Audi S5, which was a V6. The Ford GT is a V6. I've had quite a few six cylinder engines over the years, and I'm a big fan of this engine. Super responsive, and here it revs to over 8,000 RPM. I've got the car in normal race mode, but if I press here, I can go into bumpy road mode, soften the suspension a touch, and it gets even better for these kinds of lanes. And it's just absolutely brilliant. Honestly, there's, I mean, this is the same route I actually test drove recently, the demo car from HRO in Hatfield, where I revealed my specification. But for driving down these kinds of places, this thing is brilliant. Now, I've got the regular Bridgestone Potenza tires on here, as opposed to the more track-focused tires or Cup 2s that I have on the SF90, which is another difference, actually, between them. It's so good. It is so good. There's so much torque. Now, you can, of course, soften things down a touch, and we will do that in a second. But for the first 600 miles, you have to ease into it a little bit, basically a thousand kilometers, so even there at about 5,000 RPM. It sounds amazing. Like, it sounds absolutely amazing. I can only begin to imagine what full RPM is going to sound like in my car. I mean, I've driven an 812, sorry, an 812, a 296 GTS. I was thinking GTS too much out in Italy and had a whole lot of fun with it beforehand. My word. The other hand, though, you turn it down, sport, or you could go into wet, put it in hybrid mode, back into auto, it will eventually drop and go into E drive. Wait for it to do that. There we go. Now you're driving silently. You have the 15 miles, 25 kilometers of electric range. Hybrid in here is interesting though. Again, more comparisons with SF90. Like for me, with most of my short journeys, I can actually just do this. I can actually drive from base to wherever I'm going in electric and get back home again. Often I actually do that. And I've seen a few people ask, does that count towards the running in mileage? Because running in mileage is all about getting an engine prepped, right? Doing the mileage on the engine to have it ready for journeys ahead. And yes, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you would think it needs 600 miles of engine running, but they don't differentiate from any Thing that I've ever seen anywhere. Um, I tend to just pop it into E-Drive. You get this nice blue display in the center of the dashboard and you're then driving in full electric. And it's the odd silence. I mean, even with the window down, you hear a little bit of electrical whir. And as we're gonna get to the national speed limit signs here in electric, I'll put my foot down just for a second. Cause it's actually quite fun. Not as much power as the SF90, but we're up to the speed limit just like that pretty smooth and easy and it's a very very different driving experience and I also enjoy that I can charge at the farm where we negotiated an amazing rate on electricity a long time ago we have had an amazing rate negotiated it's very very cheap to charge an electric car which is brilliant or of course we go the other way we pop it back into performance mode which again like I said there we go wait for the engine is brilliant go back into race we're not going to go ct off or anything heroic today start dropping the gears i mean look at this proper greasy countryside lanes oh it's so good it rides so well it's very soft i'm going to press bumpy road because whenever you change the manatino it goes out of bumpy road i kind of wish it would automatically stay if you've turned on bumpy road but that's the same behavior as the sf90 so i'm used to it down here it is honestly i think the best car you can currently buy for driving these kinds of roads in the united kingdom like i know people won't necessarily love the haptic controls the touch controls on the steering wheel but having done so many miles in cars with them i'm fully used to it and here it is brilliant it is absolutely brilliant like no question no question give me any of my cars now to come and drive on a road like this and i'm going to be grabbing this thing it sounds extraordinary the ride quality is brilliant and you just feel so good at the wheel of it and it's so exciting and fun I this, this car is amazing. It's really amazing. I think we should move on to talking about the Ferrari game, as I mentioned it earlier. And I've seen so much of this recently in the comments with everything. Announcing the XX, ordering the Roma Spider, taking delivery of the Pro Sangue 296 GTS, etc. And this game, which is by no means exclusive to Ferrari. I'm actually going to close the rear window for a second. 
the concept of owning multiple products from a brand, which obviously then puts you in line for being able to buy the special limited edition, harder to get stuff. It's a chicken and egg thing. This idea that, yes, if you buy the products, you're a good friend of the brand, then you can get the special ones, or are you buying the products so that you can kind of force your way in to getting them in the first place? Now, to talk about the industry in general, in fact, talking about luxury goods in general, you know of this from Rolex with watches. You buy a few Rolexes, you get to get the special ones, the rarer ones, the harder to secure ones, with MS for handbags, exactly the same thing. And then when it comes to cars, whether it's Ferrari to get an XX or Porsche to get a new GT3 RS or even McLaren to get an LT or, and I'll tell you a story about the Senna as well, or with anybody, whether it's Mercedes for a Black Series or BMW for the M4 CSL, the 3 liter CSL, sorry. It's all about relationship. And I don't think this should be in any way a surprise to anybody. If you're not a person who likes that brand's products, who's been a part of the brand, who's owned, used, enjoyed, shared these kinds of cars, why would you expect to be able to walk into a dealer and purchase their new, highly limited edition product? That's not how the world works. These products are aspirational. These are things that you grow up and get towards. You know, the XX will be my, I want to say, eight Ferrari. It's, you know, quite a few down the line to be able to own something that is that special. And okay, yes, Ferrari are probably more famous for this. No, I would say Porsche are probably number one. And JM actually did a brilliant video recently about Porsches in this context. But Ferrari are well known for having a system behind the scenes for buying each different car. And, you know, if you want an SF90XX, obviously you needed to have bought an SF90. You need to have a few other Ferraris in your garage. You need to be known to them as a person who's going to keep the cars, drive the cars, or add the cars to their collection, not somebody who's going to flip one. As soon as you've flipped something immediately, you're going to be struck off that list and you are never going to be at the top of the queue for something special that comes again. And I touched on this with the Pura Sangue because values for the Pura Sangue have gone crazy recently. But obviously, if I disrespect Ferrari by selling my car, Ferrari are going to say, no, you're not having the next one because I've proven that I'm somebody who will not really be part of ultimately the brand, the passion for Ferrari. And that's what's so exciting about the brand. You see it in a funny way with Porsche because things like the 911 ST and the 9012 Speedster, the GT2 RSs and the GT4 RSs and the RS Spiders in some regions are easier than in others, but in the United Kingdom and the United States are insanely difficult to secure. Even if you buy a whole bunch of cars, and to give you an example, I owned a Taycan Turbo S, I owned a 718 GT4, I've had also a 911 2 GT3 that I bought in Europe and lost money on. I had a 981 GT4. All cars that, well, the UK ones came from dealers and offered back through dealers. So I was trying to grow my relationship with the brand. I made no secret that I was really keen to purchase a GT4 RS. I was almost led a bit astray that it would be possible. And then they just went cold on me. Complete radio silence when it came to GT4 RSs. And that's not fun. It's not there's no clarity around it all, and it just wasn't really, for me, the way Porsche do it. With Ferrari, I think there's so much more openness as a brand to embrace you as a customer. You know, I knew that if I entered into buying Ferraris over a few years, I was going to grow a big collection of them. I love these cars. I love that I get to try all of these different experiences and drive these things, and now just driving through town, pretty generic driving experience, it's still gets your heart racing. It's still a passionate thing to be at the wheel of. And of course, there is an element of buying multiple cars to be part of that. Like I make no secret that if I didn't make videos of cars every single day of my life, I wouldn't have a garage like I do. It's completely skewed and out of perspective. But I'm in a strange position where I spend my life on the road. I drive 60,000 miles a year, probably 100,000 kilometers a year, mostly in silly cars and filming them and sharing them. So to me, if let's say we're talking about the Roma, and I've driven a few Romas before, and if you watch any of my videos about the Ferrari Roma, you will see me raving about how good that car is, but how I couldn't really at the time see it fitting into my life because I didn't really, I mean, I had six cars at the time, seven cars at the time. So 
I didn't have the same kind of collection thing going on that I have now, but now I can see buying it to go on one amazing adventure with it, to have a bit of fun with it, to do some, you know, over the first year, at least a couple of thousand miles, who knows what in the second year, third year, and eventually it will move on for sure, eventually. And you know, we can talk about that with the 296 GTS and with the Pura Sangue. Eventually, I think these cars will sell. I don't think the Pura Sangue I'm gonna move for five years, seven years. It depends what comes next, really. It depends what happens in the future. We don't know about V12s and about the next Ferrari models. This car, I don't know if it'll be a couple of years, if it'll be four years, five years. I, I couldn't tell you. I want to enjoy the experiences, to enjoy the drive, to take it on different adventures, to have the fun with it like this, right? as the road opens up to be able to put the power down. And I don't have a plan behind that, but I love and I am absolutely addicted to the Ferrari buying experience, particularly with HRO and Ferrari. My sales team there, Sam and the guys, look after me amazingly well and I appreciate that an awful lot because it's a big part of the experience. It's a big part of what makes you want to buy a car is the relationship you have with the dealership. So I go back to the chicken and egg thing because for me, as I've mentioned, each of these cars are different driving experiences. They are each amazing. To me, like when I read a comment of, oh, you just had to buy that about this, I'm like, I just had to buy a 296 GTS? Are you kidding me? No, this is amazing. This is, yes, a 350,000 pound car, but like, look at this thing. Like every single time to go anywhere with it is a, is a smile on the face, to get that experience of specking it, taking delivery of it, going and driving it, doing stuff with it. So I go back to it, chicken and egg. And you know, when the Senna came out, and I just mentioned this, I was initially rejected from a Senna allocation at the first round of allocations, um, despite having had four McLarens. I had a 12C, 650, LT Coupe, and I only sold the LT Coupe for the LT Spider because at the time of the LT Coupe, they promised the Spider would never come. So that was kind of, I felt, felt a little bit fair. And I'd done five and a bit thousand miles on it. It wasn't like a flip. That would have been keeping it at delivery mileage or at least less than a few hundred uh, miles or a thousand maximum. Um, and at that stage, because they had released the 720S, I hadn't actually ordered a 720S because I didn't want to sell my 675 LT Spider. I wanted to keep a hold of that car. And therefore that didn't tick the box to buy a Senna. So it actually took a few friends at HQ pulling some strings to be able to secure the center allocation. And it's crazy because there were a ton of centers that did get immediately flipped. So for me then having known that I had to really request and get some help to get an allocation and seeing cars being flipped straight away when I wanted to go and drive mine, you know, mine did about, I'd done about 4,000 miles with it. Took it to a bunch of track days at Spa, also at the Nürburgring Nordschleifer. <laughs> You can imagine it's it's frustrating. It was a it was a strange thing, and then I always found McLaren a little bit strange. So you can hear my Porsche and McLaren experiences, but with Ferrari, like I say, I feel like there's so much more communication. I feel so much more appreciated as a customer. I feel so much more part of what they do and how they think and how they work. And like I say. There isn't this sense of feeling, oh, I have to buy this. I know there are some stories about that, and for sure, that as a dealership level will be a thing. A dealer will ask a customer to you know, put some money behind some cars, if at the end of the day, they haven't really up to that point shown that they're as tied to the brand as another customer who might be initially you know, more deserving of that allocation. And I'd have loved an 812 Competizione, for sure. Obviously, as a fairly new Ferrari customer, that wasn't going to happen, even though there are uh, 1,000, what is it, 1,800 or so of them. There are a lot of them around, 1,600 of them, I apologize, um, in total. But this is, this is not like a game in the way that people always want to think of it. To, to hear a phrase of, oh, you only bought that 296 GTS or Pura Sangue to get something else is just silly talk. It's literally silly talk because that is not how it works. These are amazing cars. The Roma, even though it's the entry Ferrari, is an amazing car, an absolutely amazing car. And to have a car, even like that in my garage as well, which I can say, sure, my dad, take for two months, go have some fun, go do 2,000 miles with it. How cool is that? That's a big part of it for me as well. 
whether it's my girlfriend also driving this car or driving the Roma or even the Pro Sangue or whatever as well, it's having these different experiences. So I've waffled on for far too long about this topic, but to me, it's about being part of the brand. It's about enjoying all the different cars. It's about being in this crazy world and so immensely fortunate and a pinch moment every single day of being able to buy these cars, being able to own and drive these cars and have them in the garage. It is absolutely crazy. I absolutely love it. And I will forever cherish and appreciate. He is on it. <laughs> he is absolutely on it. He's got Christmas lunch or dinner or something to get to. It's special. It's very special. It's pretty windy outside. Shutter is currently clattering away, but I want to talk about 296 versus SF90, if you were to do that. And I don't mean in a drag race because we have seen that from Carwell. What I mean is in terms of the driving experiences, they are so much further apart than you think. Of course, the obvious is that we have a V8 four wheel drive, a V6 rear wheel drive, and we have a convertible, and we have a fixed roof. And of course, some other technology, things like the dashboard, the steering wheel, even the seats are all very familiar, but the driving experiences are so different. When you then hop in the SF90, what you feel with this is a car that's positioned at a much more premium level. In terms of the weight of it, the feel of it, the steering is significantly heavier. Or maybe I should point this the other way around, that when they were introducing the 296, they clearly went for this more boisterous characteristic. So much lighter steering, much more responsive and twitchy pedal presses, so throttle and brake, and a car that's so much more about being a bit cheeky, being a bit cheeky, having a bit more character, whereas the SF90 feels like this ultimate grown-up serious machine. You get in this and it's like, whoa, whoa, this is something big. Now, in terms of the actual drive, something that you feel that's different between the two is how the hybrid system works. So in here, when it hops from being in electric and fires up the combustion engine, there's a bit of a lag, there's a bit of a wait until it starts. And I knew this from driving the cars before, but whether it's doing it automatically, obviously with the throttle press, when you accelerate a bit harder and you get into the, I guess, specified power band, it starts the motor. There's that weight, then the motor starts and then it pulls away. And if you're just driving an automatic hybrid, it's even longer before it will kick in. So that's one big thing compared to the SF90 because in there, it's so much more instantaneous in comparison. And here, when the engine fires, it's like, boom, go instantly, ready to go, ready to rock and roll. Another thing I noticed is that when you've been driving in electric or in hybrid mode and it's been draining the battery, and obviously they share the battery, in here, when you start this engine, and let's say you're in performance or qualifying mode, it instantly starts charging the battery, like immediately. It will start putting power back into the battery. In the 296, it takes about two or three minutes of driving before the battery starts getting any charge. And I don't know whether that's to do with the different motors or like how it's regening, or I guess in there it's regening off the front motors, it must be doing regen off the front motors. So it's a different type of setup. But in here, I have my standard thing that you don't want to arrive somewhere with it on zero at the end of the day, in case you leave it for longer than you should. They don't like that. So I try to leave the cars when I'm gonna arrive somewhere with one or two bars of electric. So this is something in the SF90, I've got very used to a couple of minutes before I'm gonna park up, ping it on. It will make sure that it's got two bars and enough to park silently in E-Drive if you want to at home. Whereas in the 296, I haven't got my head around it yet. Like I say, well, we're now nearly 400 miles after today's drive in total on the Odo, but it's different and I need to do some learning. And maybe this is actually one for a full topic to explain a little bit more because having driven so many miles with this, it's about 9,000 miles, so 15,000 kilometers, and having driven, what, four or five different 296s in total, my car, the dealer car, the convertible, and a GTB on the road and a GTB on the track. So I've driven five different 296s. I've got a fair bit of understanding as to how it works. One design detail that when you're driving is really nice is this, this floating bridge across the back, because what happens when you brake with the upper brake light being back here is that it illuminates this entire surround. So when you look in your rear view mirror, you're looking through this kind of red circle around it, which actually is really cool, as well as looking very smart having that floating element over the top, which is reminiscent of the older cars. So initial experiences with this have been really fun. I just find it fascinating, like I said, how 
they're not the same car. Like you think that you think that these two should be really quite similar and there shouldn't be any room to have both of them in the garage together, but they are totally different experiences. If you're just going to hop in one to drive to the shops, you don't want to just jump in the SF90. It, it's not like that. Whereas you do just want to hop into the 296. On the other hand, this doesn't feel quite the same in terms of a really serious event to take out. This feels like you can just go and just drive it, just do whatever, which is a good thing and a bad thing because it makes it a very usable car and really very much the car that I'm going to be using for a lot of general short drives and things. But it doesn't have the same sense of occasion and experience that you get from this thing. With that parked back in a normal position then for the time being, it's fun having the three Ferraris over on this side of the Schmuseum. I think when it comes to the special cars, the XX, for example, it's like a reward for your loyalty to the brand. It's the same with a 911 ST. If you're a loyal Porsche customer, being able to be allocated one of those is a reward for all of the cars that you've purchased and your loyalty to the brand. So from my side, obviously I feel incredibly lucky that the XX is coming. It's my first limited series special Ferrari, but each of these, in no way have I been told I had to buy that or that I have to buy this or that I have to do this to get that or something like that. For me, it's all been personal choice. And there are other things in my mind and other experiences and other cars that are already on the market that, I, and as you know, I love specking new cars. Most of the cars here in the garage are new, but there are cars I'd like to experience that I can't order new. So I will be buying at some point to, to try out, to share, to have some fun with. This is a cracking machine. These three are all cracking machines. E each one of these cars is like one of the best of its kind, of its segment. That, that's what's so crazy about all of this. Even like I said, the Roma, it's like the entry Ferrari, but we only look at it like a weaker car because it's the entry Ferrari. It's still a Ferrari. It is still a fabulous car. And that's just crazy to me. Anyway, enough waffling on on this topic. That's a bit of the backstory, a bit of an understanding out of it all. I'm loving the Ferrari collection right now. I would love this garage in a few years time to have even more Ferrari cars in it. And something tells me that might be happening. That's it for now though. Thank you very much for watching guys. I appreciate your support an awful lot. And I'll see you again very soon for plenty more miles with, with each of these. See you then. Cheers.